if you're new or you're visiting or you haven't been here for a while, we're continuing our series in the Gospel of John, if you didn't work out from that passage, called Holy Genoli. And this morning we find ourselves in a passage that's known as the healing of an official son. Jesus has finished this mini three-day ministry trip to Samaria. It's been super fruitful. The Bible says that many have believed. And now he's headed back to Galilee. And a royal official who's based in Capernaum, which just so you know is about a one to two days journey from Galilee, catches wind that Jesus is returning to the region and given the fact that he has a son who is about to die, just let that sink in, he has a son who's about to die, he decides to head down to Galilee to see if this miracle working rabbi might be able to come and heal his son. And so he gets to Galilee, he tracks down Jesus, and then he begins to implore him to come and heal his son. The Greek actually is translated to shamelessly beg. This is a royal official, probably never shamelessly begged in his life, right? But the stakes are high enough. And so he's shamelessly begging, Jesus, come and heal my son. Jesus, come and heal my son. And eventually Jesus says to the man, go your son lives. And so the man heads off home and en route he runs into a couple of his servants who have actually started to go and find him because they want to share the amazing news that somehow, we know how, miraculously, this son has been healed. And so when the father inquires of them, exactly when did the son get better? Sure enough, he's not surprised to find out that it was the exact time of day when Jesus had declared, go, your son lives. And on the surface, this story seems pretty straightforward, right? It's not particularly like, you know, random. It's not over the top. Yes, it's miraculous. But given the fact of Jesus' ministry, it's pretty stock standard. I mean, this is not Jesus turning 750 liters of water into wine for a mega party, right? That was a head scratcher to start with. This seems pretty stock standard. Jesus, Messiah, healing a sick boy about to die. However, everyone say however. However, what do we learn in week two about miracles in John's gospel? Well, firstly, he includes how many miracles? Seven in his entire gospel. To put that in perspective, each of the other gospels have nearly 30 or more miracles recorded. Like John's gospel is a bit of a greatest hits, right, for Jesus' miracles. He only includes very specific miracles for very specific reasons. Reasons. Well, what else did we discover about Jesus' miracles in John's gospel? Does John use the word miracle in his gospel? No. What word does he use instead? <sighs> Sign. Sign. And remember what we said? Despite Every other gospel, in fact, nearly the whole of the New Testament, using this word dunamis, where we get dynamite from, miracle. Despite nearly the whole of the New Testament using this word exclusively, John, he doesn't use it. He uses the word sign. And in week two, we looked at what that meant. The word sign means something that marks something or something that indicates something else, or something that points to something else. You see, John is absolutely adamant that Jesus' miracles won't be construed in his gospel as Jesus just performing a bunch of tricks, right, to impress people. Jesus is not after recognition. He's not after bums on seat. The whole point of Jesus' miraculous signs is that they point to something else. So we have to ask ourselves this morning then, 
What is this sign? It's the second in his gospel. What is this sign pointing to? What is the higher truth or the higher reality baked into this story that John so desperately wants us to catch? Why does he include this sign or this story, one of only seven in his entire gospel, at the expense of so many others? Well, I believe what John wants us to catch this morning, what this sign and this story are pointing to, is the nature of belief. That there's a certain way to believe that authenticates itself as real. And there's also a way that we can believe that falls horribly short. There's a belief that's contingent and there's a belief that's courageous. But only one of these types of belief leads to eternal life. So let's jump back into the story. But I want to pick it up from the verse prior to where our story starts. You see, one of the unhelpful things about English syntax and the fact that this was transferred on what was just once upon a time an epically long paragraph on one giant scroll, the problem with transferring it into the Bible as we know and adding things like chapters and page numbers and things like that is that sometimes we can lose the flow. Sometimes we can lose the connectedness of thoughts or ideas that are supposed to go together. Sometimes we can lose the context of what the author wants us to inform the coming story because it doesn't fit in our cute little English brackets. And I think this is a perfect example this morning. You see, if you dive straight into our text, straight into the story proper in verse 46, how does it start? It says, Therefore, he came to Cana of Galilee where he had made water wine, and there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. Therefore. What does therefore mean? Because of this, or for this reason, or in light of this, in light of what? In light of what's just come before, right? So immediately, as soon as we see this word, therefore, we realize there's actually some setting and some context that we're missing that we need to be aware of. So let's read. The end of the previous story where Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well, as this is actually... The introduction or the context, it's the setting for our story today. Verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there for two days. Verse 43. After the two days, he left for Galilee. Verse 45. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. Now, this final verse, a verse that almost feels a little bit ignore-worthy, right, is actually disproportionately important to our story. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen, key word, seen, All that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. Now, let me ask you a question. If if we were to read this verse, this last verse 45, in isolation, we would walk away thinking that the Galileans were happy that Jesus was back, right? Which they were. But why they welcomed him or why they're happy that he's back is actually what sets the scene for everything to come. You see, John is actually having a crack here at the Galileans. He's having a crack here at the motivation behind their welcome. But to understand this, we actually have to join a couple of dots. John tells us in verse 45, they welcomed him. Why? Because they had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they had also been there. What had Jesus done at the Passover festival? Well, John tells us in chapter 2, verse 23. 
Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. All right, so Jesus has done a bunch of miraculous stuff at Passover, right? And the people have seen this stuff, and because they've seen it, they've believed in him. But remember, John adds a really peculiar comment straight after this verse in verse 24 to help qualify for us the kind of belief, the kind of belief that they had. What does he say? Now, while he was in Jerusalem at Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But, everyone say, but, but but Jesus would not believe in them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person's heart. You know, in other words, what Jesus is saying is that, yes, the people were impressed by his miracles. Yes, they believed in him. However, Jesus knew that their belief was surface level. Jesus knew that their belief was fickle. It was contingent, what does John say? On what they saw. And this is the critique that John intends us to keep in mind as we read this story about Jesus' healing of the official son. So let's jump back into this story and let's keep that in front of our mind as the context for what we read. Verse 46. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him or believed in him. Why? Because they had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival. For they also had been there. Verse 46. Therefore, he came to, again to Cana of Galilee where he had made water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Now, I don't want you to be fooled by the language here, right? Yes, Jesus said this to the man, But what he actually says in many ways was not directed to the man, but the people around the man. It's kind of like when a parent says, and I'm sure you've never done this, talking to their little kid, yes, darling, in the presence of their spouse, I know, darling, but dad doesn't want to go, so we can't. You know, or you're at work, right? And in front of Julie, someone says, oh, I'd love to help with that initiative. But Julie said we had to prioritize data management, and so I don't have time. You know what I mean? He's talking not just to someone, but through them, right? And this, I think, is what's happening here. He's directing his remarks not so much at this Gentile official, but actually at the people around him. In fact, Jesus' response in the Greek is in the plural. You see, he's directing this cutting remark to the Galileans rather than this Gentile himself. And his remark is to do with their fickle belief. Verse 48. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will simply not believe. And this is actually the great issue that Jesus is addressing. This is the reason, the great purpose for including this sign for John. That belief predicated on signs or contingent on miracles isn't actually belief. Think about it. If I said to Bianca, hey, Dal, uh, are you happy if I go for a run for a couple of hours? And if I do, when I come back, I'll cook dinner and I'll clean the house. Fair deal? Now, if she turns around and says to me, sure, as soon as the house is clean and dinner's cooked, who knows she doesn't actually trust me or our deal, right? The reality is... The moment proof is required is actually the moment the trust or belief ceases to exist. I'll say that again. The moment proof is required is the moment that belief ceases to exist. 
You know the word for believe used here in this passage and all throughout John's gospel is actually the same word for faith. It's the word pistis. Jesus is saying faith by definition is not faith if it requires a sign or a proof to be initiated. And this is the same point that the writer of Hebrews makes, right? What does he say? Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what? What we do not see. You see, this is Jesus' entire rebuke. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Faith or belief that requires proof, faith or belief that is dependent on what we see, this is contingent belief. And this is not the kind of belief that Jesus is after, amen? Well, if that's contingent belief, then what's courageous belief? Well, having set up the dramatic contrast between what belief isn't, John now climaxes the story with what belief is. Follow with me. Verse 48. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Now, completely unfazed by this, right? Almost like he knew Jesus wasn't talking to him. What does the official say? Verse 49. The royal official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son lives. And here is the absolute climax of the story. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke. You see, this is what both John and Jesus want us to catch. This is belief, right? This is faith. This is courageous belief. Taking Jesus at his word, believing his word and taking action in response to it, even in the absence of seeing. But I want you to see something this morning. This is not me emphasizing some cute passage in one little passage in John just so I can tick off another sermon for another week. This is not me making, are you ready for this, a sermon out of a molehill. You like that? This is actually one of the most critical themes that John threads through his whole gospel. Think about it. How does John introduce his gospel? How does he start it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That in Jesus, the Word, salvation, comes to humanity, and that it's only by believing in His words that we get to participate in it, right? In fact, Nearly every chapter in John's gospel, he references this or builds on this theme of words of Jesus being the thing that initiate belief. Look at John 2 verse 22. Then they believed the scripture and the what? The words that Jesus had spoken. John 3 34. For the one who came, for the one whom God has sent, My brain is working faster than my mouth. Speaks the what? The words of God. John 5, 24. Very very truly, I tell you. This is pretty much the same as saying truly, truly. Which is, remember, mega important. Truly, truly, I tell you. Whoever hears my what? Word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. In fact... This is so important to John, particularly in this sign, that look at what he says at the end of the story of the Samaritan woman, which leads directly into this one. Verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed. Why? Because they saw? Because they had proof? No. What does it say? Because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard, not seen, 
for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. You know what though? This is actually even bigger than just John's gospel. This is something that Jesus reiterates all throughout his ministry. This is something that Jesus presses down time after time. Do you remember the parable that he tells about the rich man and the beggar Lazarus? It's found in Luke 16. There's a beggar named Lazarus, not to be confused with Jesus' buddy who he raises from the dead. There's a beggar named Lazarus and there's a rich man. And all the time, this beggar is at the rich man's gate, wanting even just some scraps off his table, and he doesn't get anything. And the rich man just gorges himself, indulges. And they both happen to die, right? The rich man goes to hell. Lazarus, the beggar, goes to heaven. Remember the story? And they're in heaven, and and the rich man says, Abraham... Can you send Lazarus to come and dip my tongue in cool water because I'm in torment here? And what does Abraham say? Calm as... No, he doesn't say that. He says, even if this guy was willing, he can't because of the great chasm between us. And then what does the rich man say? He says, well, if not that, send him to warn my brothers and my family so they don't end up here. And what does Abraham say? Verse 28, Luke 16. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. And here is Jesus' point. Listen to this. If people don't believe the words of Jesus, they won't believe the works of Jesus. If people don't believe the words of Jesus, they will not believe the works of Jesus, even if that work, and you think about this, is Jesus rising from the dead. If people don't believe the words of Jesus, they will not believe the works. It's because faith that's dependent on proof is not faith. Belief that's contingent on seeing is not belief. Belief is only belief. It's only courageous belief when we take Jesus at His Word. When, like the man in this story, we had back to our chaos, we head back to our crisis, back to our fear, back to our stronghold, back to our situation with nothing other than Jesus' Word as collateral. This is courageous belief. Trusting in the person and the words of Jesus Christ. And this is our challenge, right? I mean, you think about it. We say, in fact, most of us here would say that we believe in Jesus. But more often than not, what do we do? We wait for a sign. We say, God, I'm not budging until He does this. God, I'm not sacrificing anymore until she does that. Until I see a sign, until I see a proof that warrants my belief that things will get better, that you're actually at work. God, I'm not believing that you will rescue my finances. God, I'm not believing that you will meet my heart's deepest desire. I'm not believing that you'll rescue my marriage, that you'll rescue my joblessness, my uncertainty, my doubts, my fear, my anxiety, until... I see my spouse change until I see my finances improve. 
until I see my circumstances progress. But church, this is not belief. We literally cannot claim that Jesus is our Savior, that we believe in Him and His Word, and then cherry pick His words that we think are either reasonable, doable, or applicable. Notice when it says in the Word that He who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, that there is no qualifiers to that. There is no, you know, hey, there's a certain level of brokenness or sin that if you get caught up in, sorry, can't really help you with that. Sorry, my redemption and my sanctification, well, it kind of stops here. We don't see that, do we? No, it says that he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Will we believe the words of Jesus? Notice when Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. There is no part B to this verse. There is, you know, oh, but by the way, your heart's desire or those super super deep longings that you have for that friendship or for that marriage or in that situation. Oh, you know what? That was kind of outside the scope of what I was thinking when I said that. That's not what he says. No, he says, if you seek me and my kingdom first, wholeheartedly, unreservedly, then all these things will be added unto you. Will we believe Jesus' words? Notice when Jesus says... For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That again, there is no qualifiers here, right? He doesn't say, oh, actually, you know what? That was a doozy. Like that was an epic sin that landed your ways. In fact, it was intentional. So you know what? You get a hall pass. You don't have to forgive him for that one. No, what does he say? He says, the moment, hear this, the moment you stop being a vessel of my grace is the moment that you stop receiving my grace. The moment you choose, for whatever reason, to stop being a vessel of my grace is the moment you will stop receiving my grace. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. You know, in the 11th century, during the Crusades, which were a bunch of wars that went on between Christians and mostly Muslims and people of other faith, a bunch of the Christians at that time who were getting baptized, would get baptized with their hands above the water. You know why? Because they were saying to themselves, you know what, God? You can have my whole life. You can have my heart. I surrender to you, right? I believe your words and I believe the words that you've spoken, I'm called to obey. Minus my hands. Because I kind of need them to kill people in battle, right? I mean, how ludicrous is that? Thinking that a person can fully surrender or fully commit their life to Jesus minus just this little part or just this little aspect of my life or heart. But church, we do this all the time, right? We say, yeah, sure, God, I believe your words about generosity. I believe your words about patience. I believe your words about dying for me on the cross. But holiness, forgiveness, I don't know. Following in your footsteps of sacrificial love and grace. You know what? I think I'll just keep that little area of my life above water, right? Church, we have a a choice this morning. We can either be like the Galileans and have contingent belief 
Belief that's conditional on what we see, contingent on things going according to our plan or things going in a way that we deem fair or reasonable or just. Or we can have courageous belief. Belief that says, okay, Jesus, if these are your words, if you said this, then man, I'm going to believe it. Yes, I'm freaking out. Yes, this is going to be hard. Yes, I'm going to need your help. And there's absolute no certainty that this ends well for me or pain-free. But friends, that's the kind of belief that Jesus calls us to full stop. Church, Jesus says to us this morning, Go, your son lives. Go, your finances live. Go, your marriage lives. Go, your healing lives. But the question is this. Will we, like the Gentile father, believe the word of Jesus or will we dismiss it, excuse it, or justify it? Because right here, right now, there just doesn't seem to be any proof that it's actually going to work out the way I'm believing. I wonder what specific word... Jesus is challenging you to believe this morning. Maybe it's the word that holiness matters. That in choosing to put Jesus before your body, before your fleshly desires, that He will work together all things for your good. Amen. Maybe it's in your finances. Maybe things look bleak and that's an understatement. But he wants you to believe that he is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Amen? Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's in your dreams. Maybe it's in your longings that don't seem like they're ever going to be met the way things are right now. And Jesus would say to you, seek my kingdom first. Seek me. Seek intimacy with me. Seek the grace and the goodness of every person in every situation. No buts, no ifs, no whens. And all these things will be added unto you. Church, I don't know where you're at this morning. But the question is this. What belief are you holding on to? A contingent one or a courageous one? You know, Peter had this beautiful moment where he realized he had this epic revelation about this truth itself. Things had started going bad, right? People en masse were deserting Jesus. And you remember the conversation that Jesus has with his disciples? Will you also desert me? And what does Peter say? He says, where else would we go? And are you ready for it? You have the words of eternal life. You see, Peter knew the truth that Jesus' words were the pathway to eternal life. That enacting, no matter what we see, Jesus' words was the very thing, the only thing that could bring about abundance, that could bring about healing, provision, restoration, forgiveness, and the list goes on. All of the things that the world's best logic, the world's greatest pleasure, and the best of earth's wisdom can never muster. Church, the question is simple this morning. Will you believe the words of Jesus? Will you believe the words of Jesus? Not cherry pick the ones that seem, ah, I think I can do these. Ah, this kind of makes sense in my life and circumstances right now. Will you believe the words of Jesus? How will you respond this morning? With courageous belief or contingent belief? Let's pray.